Natasha, wasted with a pale and stern face, not at all shamefaced as Pierre expected her to be, was standing in the middle of the drawing room. When Pierre appeared at the doorway, she became flustered, obviously undecided whether to go to him or wait for him. Pierre hastily went up to her. He thought that she would give him her hand, as always, but coming close to him, she stopped, breathing heavily and lowering her arms lifelessly, in exactly the same pose in which she came out to the middle of the room to sing, but with quite a different expression. Pyotr Kurilich, Prince Bolkovsky was your friend. Is your friend. She corrected herself. It seemed to her that everything only was, and that now it was all different. He told me then to turn to you. Pierre sniffed silently, looking up at her. Up to then, he had reproached her in his soul and had tried to despise her. But now he felt such pity for her that there was no room in his soul for reproach. He's here now. Tell him to... Um... Forgive me. She stopped and began to breathe still more rapidly. She did not cry. Yes. Sir. Yes. Yes, I, I, I'll tell him. But uh, he did not know what to say. Natasha was evidently afraid of the thought that might have occurred to Pierre. No, I know it's all over. No, it, it can never be. I'm only tormented by the wrong I've done him. Tell him only that I beg him to forgive me, to forgive me for everything. <laughs> Her whole body shook and she sat down on a chair. A feeling of pity such as he had never experienced before overflowed Pierre's soul. I'll tell him. I'll tell him everything once more. But I'd like to know one thing. What? I'd like to know whether you loved Pierre did not know what to call Anatole, and he blushed at the thought of him. Whether you loved that, that bad man. <laughs> don't call him bad. But uh, I don't know. I don't know anything. She began to cry again. A still greater feeling of pity, tenderness, and love took hold of Pierre. He felt tears flowing behind his spectacles and hoped they would not be noticed. Let's not talk anymore, my friend. It seemed so strange suddenly for Natasha to hear that meek, tender, heartfelt voice. Let's not talk, my friend. I'll tell him everything. But one thing I ask you, consider me your friend. And if you need help, advice, or simply to pour out your soul to somebody. Not now, but when your soul is clear, remember me. I'll be happy to if I'm able. Don't talk to me like that. I'm not worthy of it. She was about to leave the room, but Pierre held her back by the hand. He knew he had something more to tell her, but when he said it, he was surprised at his words himself. Stop it, stop it. You have your whole life ahead of you. Ahead of me? No. For me, all is lost. All is lost? If I were not I, but the handsomest, brightest, and best man in the world, and I was free, I would go on my knees this minute and ask for your hand and your love. Natasha, for the first time in many days, wept tears of gratitude and tenderness, and after glancing at Pierre, left the room. Pierre, too, following her, almost ran out to the front hall, holding back the tears of tenderness and happiness that choked him, put on his coat, and, missing the sleeves, got into the sleigh. Where to now, sir? asked the coachman. Where to? Pierre asked himself. Where can I go now? Not to the club or to pay visits? All people seemed so pitiful, so poor in comparison with the feeling of tenderness and love he experienced, in comparison with that softened, grateful glance she'd given him at the last moment through her tears. Home, said Pierre, throwing open the bearskin coat on his broad, joyfully breathing chest despite the 10 degrees of frost. It was cold and clear. Above the city, semi-dark streets Above the black roofs stood the stark, starry sky. 
Only looking at the sky did Pierre not feel the insulting baseness of everything earthly compared with the height his soul had risen to. At the entrance to Arbat Square, the huge expanse of the dark, starry night opened out to Pierre's eyes. Almost in the middle of that sky, over Prechestensky Boulevard, stood the huge, bright comet of the year 1812. Surrounded, strewn with stars on all skies, but different from them in its closeness to the Earth, its white light and long raised tail. The same comet which presaged, as they said, all sorts of horrors and the end of the world. But for Pierre, this bright star with its long, luminous tail did not arouse any frightening feeling. On the contrary, Pierre, his eyes wet with tears, gazed joyfully at this bright star, which having flown with inexpressible speed through immeasurable space on its parabolic course, suddenly like an arrow piercing the earth, seemed to have struck here, its one chosen spot in the black sky and stopped. Its tail raised energetically, its white light shining and playing among the countless other shimmering stars. It seemed to Pierre that this star answered fully to what was in his softened and encouraged soul, now blossoming into new life. <laughs>